Please welcome the Director General of the National Council for Crime Prevention, Mr. Erik Wenderström. Thank you, Minister, Excellencies, distinguished guests, speakers and participants. Warmly welcome to the 11th Stockholm Criminology Symposium. This year, the symposium welcomes 500 participants from 30 different countries. Uh, we have a program that uh, covers 53 sessions and nearly 200 speakers. As you all know, the main theme of the symposium this year is parents, peers, and prevention. We also have another theme, a general theme at the symposium, which is contemporary criminology. I would like to extend a special welcome to the prize winners, Regents Professor Emeritus Travis W. Hershey, Professor Kathy spatz widdom and Professor Perolof Wikström. Uh, the prize winners will give their prize winners lecture tomorrow at 1.30. I would also like to give a special welcome to the Minister for Justice and Migration, Morgan Johansson, who soon will be participating in the opening discussion. From reading the abstracts and seeing all of you researchers and practitioners here, I'm convinced that we will have three very stimulating, interesting, and uh, intellectually nutritious days here in Stockholm together. This evening, uh, don't miss out on the poster session and the welcome reception in the atrium outside here tonight at 5 p.m. This poster session gives you a chance to network, meet other researchers and discuss uh, ongoing projects and, and uh, new results. As was mentioned in the introduction, we will also arrange a networking lunch during the lunch break tomorrow. Uh, and we hope that you'll find that the lunch is a, also a good way to network with your colleagues. And we are very honored that uh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice will host this lunch. This year, the Jerry Lee Lecture will be given by John McDonald. John McDonald is a Professor of Criminology and Sociology at the University of Pennsylvania and a Fox Faculty Director, Fels Institute of Government. The lecture will focus on the role of science uh, in designing safer and healthier cities around the world. And it'll take place on Thursday at uh, 11 o'clock. Ladies and gentlemen, let me quote you a text that could be familiar to some of you. I quote, the children now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority, they show disrespect for elders and love chatter in place of exercise. Children are now tyrants, not the servants of their households. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents, chatter before company, etc., and tyrannize their teachers, unquote. Uh, now, I recall this text from, from, from high school. Uh, the teacher reading out the text would ask, from whence does it emanate this text? Uh, and the answers in the classroom would range from within a few decades, maybe, upon which the, uh, the teacher told us how wrong we were. Uh, yes, I was uh, quoting Plato, uh, and Plato is, uh, in this text, attributing uh, these words to Socrates, from whom we unfortunately have no original texts. But it takes place in a dialogue. <clears throat> I thought of this text uh, in preparation of this year's symposium as apparently the relation between one preceding generation and the succeeding generation, as well as the relations within one generation when it comes to behavior and morals is something that appears to have been a preoccupation for humans for quite some time. Now, 2,400 years later, following this dialogue, we meet here in Stockholm to celebrate the achievements that bring this, brings this preoccupation into the realm of scientific results in the area of criminology. 
The theme for this symposium has been chosen to provide a framework for the celebration of the achievements of the prize winners this year. Parents, peers, and prevention. I would like to thank you all for coming here to Stockholm and to the symposium. By bringing your work to the Stockholm Criminology Symposium and sharing it with all of us, new knowledge is spread, new connections are made, and the prospects for future decisions affecting us all being guided by this knowledge increases. I wish you a very rewarding symposium. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will now turn to the opening discussion and uh, welcome the panelists up on stage. I will introduce our moderator who will then introduce the other panelists. And I have the honor to introduce Professor Lawrence Sherman. Uh, Lawrence Sherman is director of the Institute of Criminology of the University of Cambridge, where he has served as Wolfson Professor of Criminology since 2007. He is also co-chair of the Stockholm Prize in Criminology jury as well as director of the Jerry Lee Center for Experimental Criminology and chair of the Cambridge Police Executive Program that offers postgraduate degree and non-degree courses on evidence-based policing to police leaders and crime analysts from around the world. Professor Sherman earned his, earned his PhD from Yale University and has been awarded honorary doctorates from the University of Stockholm and Denison University. His research interests are in the fields of crime prevention, evidence-based policy, restorative justice, police practices, and experimental criminology. Ladies and gentlemen, assist me in welcoming Professor Lawrence Sherman. Thank you very much, Dr. Wennerstrom, and thank you for your invitation to chair this uh, most important <coughs> panel. Uh, that begins the Stockholm Symposium in Criminology uh, every year. Uh, now, in its 11th year, uh, we are delighted uh, that the vision of the founders of the Stockholm Prize uh, included the having this uh, symposium. And we'll say a lot more about uh, the prize uh, and uh, the winners uh, throughout uh, the next three days, um, but... Um, uh, this morning, we'll try to concentrate our time available on not just the three Ps of parents, peers, and prevention, but also the fourth P of policy and how the basic science that the prize winners are recognized for this year uh, can be translated, um, uh, in many cases through further research involving uh, agencies of government, uh, and indeed parents themselves. Uh, but the, the question that uh, we'll start with is trying to understand uh, how this research is different from uh, what somebody once uh, described as what my grandmother could have told you. Uh, and of course, grandmothers have lots of opinions about parents and peers. Um, uh, but um, the, the, the larger issue is, I think, to understand much more precisely uh, what uh, is the important uh, set of factors that shape people's lives, uh, not just uh, over the life course to uh, become more or less frequently involved or seriously involved in committing crimes, uh, but also uh, in one situation after another. And, and that's where uh, I think we have in this first time of combining three prize winners uh, with independent work that helps to shine the spotlight on an understanding of the role of parents in relation to peers uh, that I think goes beyond what my grandmother could have told you, uh, uh, by many miles uh, indeed. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, first um, introduce uh, the scholar who began uh, this process of understanding uh, in 1965 uh, with his research in Richmond, California uh, that began to document the relationship between uh, the way uh, young people saw uh, their families and um, other dimensions of their lives in relation to their criminal histories and their self-reported 
uh, crime. Um, he uh, produced a book out of that study uh, called Causes of Delinquency, uh, which has been described as the most influential uh, theoretical statement uh, of the 20th century uh, in, in criminology, certainly in terms of stimulating uh, research. And I'm going to ask him to come up on the stage and please welcome Professor Travis Hershey of the University of Arizona. Thank you, Travis. Um, the second contributor to this joined up body of knowledge uh, about these three Ps um, has uh, really, uh, I think, surprised many grandmothers in uh, pointing out that the notion of a cycle of violence, that bad parents uh, or badly behaved parents, uh, abusive parents in particular, uh, produce children who are therefore much more likely to go on to be abusive themselves, uh, especially to their own children, and hence we have this uh, intergenerational transmission of bad behavior that seems to be an iron law from which we can't escape. Well, I, I think that the work that was published in the leading scientific publication in the world, a Science Magazine, uh, uh, first uh, uh, in the 1980s and then again just last year, uh, has helped us to understand that there is no iron law and that in fact the odds are pretty good uh, that a, uh, an, a parent who might be abusive can still raise a child who will be law-abiding um, and probably for reasons that were uh, demonstrated by uh, Travis Hershey's uh, work in terms of the strength of the bond between the parent and child. Uh, and so even a, a bad parent uh, or a parent who is uh, badly acting in many occasions can be a good parent in building a bond with a child and help the child to prevent uh, uh, the natural inclination to, to commit crimes. And uh, that uh, contributor using official records on child abuse over a very long period of time with a match sample control group demonstrating a very small effect relative to what most people expected in this cycle of violence. That research was done by Professor uh, Kathy spatz Whittem of the John Jay College of the City University of New York, who I'm going to ask to join Professor Hershey on the stage. Please welcome Professor Kathy spatz Whittem. And both of these uh, uh, winners you see at the moment uh, began their work uh, in an era uh, before uh, the personal computer, uh, before the easy availability of uh, data processing and uh, managing big data and mass amounts of, of data. Uh, and uh, it, it, we have, as our third winner, somebody who was born in Sweden uh, worked at the National Council of Crime Prevention uh, and uh, had the opportunity to come to England with uh, support for uh, almost what you might call a cyclotron of uh, life course cr uh, criminality uh, research, uh, working with a large sample of young people in Peterborough, England, uh, whose whereabouts and whose company, whose peers, uh, and, and parenting interactions were documented uh, in enormous micro-level detail to create an understanding of the dynamics, not just the fixed experiences and attitudes uh, of young people in relation to their later development, uh, but also uh, a, a very uh, precise understanding of uh, how they were spending their time and how uh, the uh, moral uh, hazards of the different places they spent their time interacted with the level of risk that they uh, developed in their family context uh, uh, part, partly, uh, but certainly importantly, in relation to, to parenting. Uh, so what uh, we are able now to have a conversation about is uh, some of the most extremely bad parents, uh, as well as the basic practices of good parents, um, and then having this come together on the streets of Peterborough uh, in situations where people decide either to commit crimes or not based on their situational action, which is the name of the theory, uh, uh, published in a book, now conveniently available in paperback, right outside the door in the lobby. Thank you, Oxford University Press. Uh, and the author, uh, the first author of this book, uh, who has worked very closely with his other colleagues, is Professor Per Olaf Wikström of the University of Cambridge, who I'm going to ask to join his colleagues uh, on the stage. Please welcome Professor Per Olaf Wikström. Yes. 
Now, um, I think we uh, have a wide audience for all of these findings, uh, but right here in Sweden, uh, there is no one more important uh, as an audience for these findings uh, than uh, our uh, special guest today, who will actually present the prizes uh, on behalf of the Stockholm Prize in Criminology Foundation uh, tomorrow night at the, the City Hall. And we are uh, delighted that uh, this particular person uh, is, is not only in a current position that relates to issues of justice, but he previously served for four years uh, in a social services ministry where he had responsibility for policies regarding abused children. Uh, and now, as the Minister of Justice and Migration, has a much broader view over the reactions and policies of the state uh, in responses uh, to crime. Uh, I, I want to uh, ask him now to, to join us and ask you to please welcome uh, Minister Morgan Johansson, uh, Minister of Justice and Migration. Thank you, and if you'll all forgive me for uh, joining you uh, here at, at the table, uh, if the uh, sound works, then, then we're fine. Uh, and I'd like to ask uh, Travis Hershey uh, to just tell the minister a, a, a bit about uh, the, the basic uh, interaction between peers and parents that you found in a, uh, shall we say, economically challenged community uh, uh, of, of industrial origins uh, from World War II, Richmond, California, in the San Francisco Bay. I suppose my general stance was that parents and peers were uh, essentially independent. That if the a child got along well with his parents, he was protected. If he went out into the world without this connection to the parents, then the peers were a source of potential problem. But the problem came from him as well as from the peers. That is, he brought with him a tendency to be uh, influenced by them. Uh, uh, now, if I may twist the question just a little. Uh, one of the things that impressed me over the years with, with what I got wrong. Uh, one of the questions we asked was, that seemed very important, was does your, parent, does your parent, does your mother especially, know where you are when you're away from home? And we called that supervision. Mm -hmm. And it, it worked. It worked very well. And then some Scandinavian authorities, in delinquency, pointed out to me that that doesn't say anything about the mother. It says a lot about the kid. <laughs> if the mother doesn't know where he is, it's because he didn't go where she told him to go, uh, or he lied to her, right? So it's a measure of his communication with his mother. And so we, we're blaming people. They may be blamed for not knowing, but it's not that they aren't, aren't uh, trying, at least, to control the behavior of their child. So we, we give, give the parents more blame than they deserve. <clears throat> Because uh, I think it, all of us would agree that parents don't want their children to be delinquent. I but think. blaming parents is something that societies are really good at. And um, uh, thank you. I'm, I think we need to keep those on. The, the, the blaming parents is something societies are really good at. But uh, Kathy Whittem, what, what did you find about the way most people uh, uh, view the abusive uh, parents? And how do you interpret uh, both your original research and your follow-up? Uh, in relation to this tendency to write abusive parents off as being pretty worthless as an asset in, in crime prevention? Well, I have to disagree with you a little bit for the way that you are casting the findings. Um, for those of you who don't know, we uh, took a large group of children who had documented histories of abuse and neglect, and we had children who didn't have those histories, and we followed them into the future to see whether they became delinquents or adult criminals or violent offenders. And at the time that we began the work in the 1980s, everyone believed that if you were abused and neglected as a child, you, it was inevitable that you would become a delinquent. That was the, and if I gave a talk and I asked the audience how many people believe that 
abused and neglected children will become offenders, almost everyone raised their hand. And we all assumed that that was the case, and, and policies were made about that. But the findings that uh, Professor Sherman are talking about were really very surprising um, and had two messages, though. The first message was, yes, abused and neglected children are at increased risk, so they are at risk. They do become delinquents, adult criminals, and violent offenders more than other children who don't have those histories, but it is not inevitable, it is not deterministic, and that was the really important major change in the way people were forced to think about it. And we are now finding the same thing with the intergenerational transmission, so that if you yourself were abused as a child, you shouldn't go around thinking that this is sort of inevitable and that you are going to perpetrate it uh, on your own children. And, and Minister, do you think that in, in Sweden, when you held this, uh, this portfolio, that uh, what uh, Professor Whitten described as, as most people seeing it as, as inevitable, would, would that have been often the case uh, in Sweden and making it more hard, uh, more <coughs> difficult to decide when to pull the parents away from the child or not? Well, first of all, I think it's very important to say that the social services work. I mean, it, it is not something, uh, because some, some people have the perspective that it is, as Kathy said, it, 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 it's no use whatever you do. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> during my time when I was minister there for social services, I saw, I saw a lot of examples, and I met a lot of people that actually said, well, I was... I was on the way of, of, of uh, being a, a, a lifestyle uh, offender, but then something happened. Uh, it, other, in some, some cases, it was the family that helped. In some cases, it was a friend that helped. In some cases, it was actually society that, that helped. So uh, I think, uh, from my point of view, I, uh, and I'd like to, uh, I'm very interested to, to hear from you, what kind of, of, of strategies should we, should we use, should we have from the society here to, to try to support uh, families and uh, also the surrounding um, environment to these, these kids in order to, 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 to uh, make sure that they end up on the, on the right road, to transfer all the, all the, all the fantastic findings that you have said into, into uh, practic right. practically use used strategies from, from, uh, from society. Uh, so, uh, did you want to respond I, to that, I Kathy, thought I please. would respond. Yes. Um, I uh, had thought that you might ask questions about what should we do to make uh, children be able to live more productive lives. And uh, one of the things, though, that um, as thinking about it and doing a little bit of reading, I wanted to say to you uh, is that um, it, it is very difficult for me to tell you in Sweden what to do in these cases because the rates of child maltreatment, the rates of delinquency, the rates of violence, the rates of alcohol and drug problems, all of the risk factors that we know are leading to being a uh, maltreating parent, the rates in your country are so low compared to the rates uh, in the United States. So, to my mind, you are obviously doing very, very good things here, and um, I, I'm, I don't think I'm in a position to tell you necessarily what, what programs you ought to be doing, but, but you mentioned um, an individual that might have been important in a person's life, and some of the other research that I've done with um, my colleagues and my uh, students suggest that social support is really important. So whether, how we can find a way to provide a network around these children to support them, not just in, in tangible ways, but in, in other ways, is what we might call a protective factor that reduces the risk. So Perol, if Victor may have had to leave Sweden, to go to a country with much higher rates uh, to give more statistical power to the, to the research. 
Uh, and that's why he wound up in my county. Uh, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm very curious uh, to hear uh, what benefit uh, uh, his uh, research has gotten out of those much higher rates, in a, in, I must say, a much more uh, ethnically diverse, uh, uh, immigration uh, affected uh, uh, context uh, as, as Peterborough, uh, but also I, I think because um, he has very strong views on protective factors. So uh, maybe you, you could grab either the first or the second uh, uh, pieces of that question uh, in whatever order uh, you'd like. Uh, Pirolo. Well, it, I, I think uh, uh, yeah. In, the, in terms of the factors and so on, the, the, what we really have focused on is, is, is to bring together sort of the people and place element of the, the thing. And um, I think the, the basic question we need to ask ourselves when we are interested in prevention is why do actually people, uh, uh, what is the factors who moves people to do crimes and then work ourselves up from that? That's how we started. So um, in a sense, if you ask, ask yourself, why do people do crime, what moves them, then we can go on and ask questions about the important role of the families, the schools, the environments, and so on. Um, and the problem, I'm coming to your, the, the fact of a bit of a long way around, is that, um, I mean, we have hundreds, if not thousands of, of factors that are correlated with it. So we need some guidance to sort out what kind of factors what kind of processes are, are the important ones to target when we do prevention. And that's why we uh, focused in on what is it that moves people. And then you quickly come around to see that uh, people really do uh, commit crime because they see it as something that is acceptable or, um, as, as um, you could say, that they fe fell uh, to peer pressure or, or, or lack of self-control. So if you focus on these two um, aspects, if these are the main drivers of why people do crime, you can then ask questions about the families, the peers, what role do they play in, in doing this? Uh, and this is really what we have tried to do and develop methodology and, and not have time to talk about it now, but develop it later tomorrow. Yes, so, so for um, much of your work, it's partly about the peers they choose to hang out with, uh, as well as where they're hanging out. Um, and uh, Travis, I think uh, you, you were focusing on a lot of those, those issues which uh, have later been developed, I guess, around the idea of choices in affiliation and how some people choose to affiliate with the cool kids who uh, do bad things early on, like smoking or uh, uh, joyriding cars and so forth, and others don't, and that relates then back to their parents and how they get on with their parents. So how have we progressed in understanding that since 1965? Let me respond to the idea that uh, Sweden and the United States are different, uh, which uh, they are. <laughs> Glad very, we got that straight. In very many ways. But my uh, ideas have always been that these laws, whatever they may be, apply the same in all societies. And I read not a half an hour ago that all these differences between Sweden and the United States uh, boil away. Differences in family structure and family functioning have the same impact in both societies. And, and they specifically mention Sweden and the United States. So we don't have to be afraid to apply what we learn one place to another. Uh, if you look at the overall rates of crime in the modern world, uh, the United States is not quite in line with the rest of the Western world uh, and the uh, Anglosphere, but, w but the, our increased rate is essentially a difference of our ethnic mix compared to the homogeneity of these other countries. And so we can say that they're all pretty much responding to the same modernization uh, and their rates are getting better. Uh, that's another thing that we have to keep in mind when the we talk about crime policy. Is down. Whatever we're doing now, we're, it's essentially we're doing pretty good. Because <laughs> uh, uh, things are getting better. Yeah. Now, uh, the dissolution of the family <clears throat> is universal in, the, in this region, right? I mean, if you look at Sweden, uh, <clears throat> the rates of cohabitation would shock an American, uh, and our rates are very high. But it doesn't seem to have that much effect on the Swedish crime rate. Uh, 
Uh, or violent video games, Pardon? or violent video games, or spending a lot of time uh, absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely. sending text oh, well, messages. Or, or maybe all those vid video games that I, I looked around the plane yesterday and I was the only person that didn't, wasn't looking in a, one of those uh, you, may be, you, may be, you may be dangerous, I don't know, if you're not playing I, I may be. <laughs> That's right. I, I can think of other things to do. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, I, I think modernization is also uh, at risk of being overplayed in terms of mm -hmm. uh, in the wrong direction. Uh, yes, and Kathy. Uh, I, I think that the example of the cohabitation is a really uh, a good example of uh, the importance of context. Mm. And uh, what we uh, are, are trying to understand in my lab group is um, how the neighborhood, the community context plays a role in influencing the development of children. And um, what I, I think makes this point very uh, effectively is we know from the child development literature that divorce is bad for children. But in the context of a maltreating family, divorce actually turns out to be a very positive experience for these children. So we have the empirical evidence to show that. So here is, is, is reflects for me the point that we can't just take these sort of universals, and I would disagree with you, that we really have to understand the meaning mm. uh, of, of the environment that it's occurring in and uh, how it's interpreted. And so, Minister, when you, you deal with these questions, especially, I think, of neighborhood context and uh, lots of policy about housing uh, in recent years of refugees and so on, um, how, how does this conversation uh, help uh, to, to point in directions where you might be able to uh, manage some of these more challenged social contexts uh, in, in Sweden? Uh, in, in ways that might be more productive of integration, preventing riots or other uh, kinds of problems that may arise? Well, there are two answers to that, I think. Both, first, on, on a general level, I think that uh, if, if, uh, if the parents are feeling well, then probably also the children are feeling well. Mm -hmm. Why, how are the parents feeling well? Well, that is if they, they have a way of providing for their family, if they have a job, if they, if they have a situation where they can feel quite comfortable with their lives. And that transponds to the, to the children also, that they feel safer. Mm. So that, but that's on a general level. I mean, how to fight, to, to bring down unemployment, making people, uh, uh, getting uh, possibilities to, to, provide, to provide for themselves. The second issue there is <clears throat> about, uh, uh, is also, uh, is, it's also, larger one. I'd like to, to pick up on, on a, a couple of, of, of issues here. Because you mentioned, Cathy, that, that, well, Sweden, we know that we have our problems in Sweden, and in some cases it's, it's increasing in some, some problem, problems. Uh, but maybe, as you said, we have, we have a better situation than, than many other countries. And then, of course, that raises the issue, if it is better in Sweden than in many other countries, how come? Why is that? And if we're talking about children and families here, I think there are two things that we are doing that more than other countries are. First one is childcare. Mm. I mean, we actually, every, every child from two or three years of age is, having, uh, is, is in childcare, which means that they have an environment where if the parent is not working as it, as it is, then there is someone else that can support them. Sometimes we say, well, when, when families are weak, well, society must be strong. And childcare, as we have, as we have in, in Sweden for almost every child, I think that's one, one thing to mention. The other thing is we also have a parental leave, which is a possibility for parents to connect to the children in a quite long period of time. Mm. Uh, which sometimes can play on the other side because, I mean, if it, if it is a bad parent, well, how uh, that can play on the, on the other side. But I think the, these two issues are actually, they are sticking out in, in the Swedish perspective. 
maybe if you could elaborate a little bit about that, uh, I would be very, uh, it would be very helpful. Third thing is, as you mentioned also, segregation. And that comes into what kind of friends do the, the children have? And I mean, if growing up in a deprived area where a lot of, uh, of, of uh, parents does not have any, does not have a work, uh, where the children, the young kids are saying, well, there is no future here. Uh, we have to, uh, and they've also been drawn into organized crime because of that. Um, how do you, uh, have you seen, how do you look upon the issue of just segregation where people with social problems are, are concentrated in certain areas? That would be very interesting for me to hear. Right. Well, I, I think uh, the variability uh, on that uh, is different in all th uh, three studies. Maybe I should just ask P.O. Uh, in, in the context of Peterborough, is, pretty, uh, is unemployment fairly rare among the parents of your kids, or is, or is it much more common in certain neighborhoods or certain groups than others? And how does it affect that relationship with the, the children and their, and their peers? I don't think that is a particularly big issue uh, with, uh, as a factor in, in, in crime causation. I think, if I, if I may, uh, on your question with the neighborhoods and so on, what we do find is a lot of research is concentrated on looking at neighborhoods and the neighborhood context. But what we really do find is that the same kid or the different kids who live in the same neighborhoods use space very differently. So some people spend a lot of time in the neighborhoods, other goes on, has a lot to do with family management in, in, in this sense. So, so um, we, we should be a bit careful with just looking at neighborhoods in itself because it really is what kind of environments you are exposed to and a lot of the environments that are problematic may be outside. Having, having said that, um, if you think about the context and, and, and the person is that what our research clearly shows is that some young people or some children are almost immune to environmental influences or, or we say criminogenic environmental influences. In a good way or a bad way? Well, in both. Some are very sensitive. Yeah. So, so it, 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 it really um, highlights that what you bring to the um, uh, place or situation or setting is really important for how you respond to the settings. So we have two things. We, we know very well from research that there are environments that are not good for people to be in. And we know that there are um, individual characteristics that makes you more prone to do crime. When these things come together, that, that's really when, when you have problems. And, and if you look at the neighborhoods, I mean, um, when I worked in the Crime Prevention Council for many, many years, we already then warned about this trends with uh, divergent neighborhoods and problems. And, and you can really see how concentrating uh, sort of families, schools with weak resources and so on, fuels these kind of problems. But one thing I think we haven't talked about, which is really important to mention, in addition to parents, is teachers. Because the, the, the parent-teachers uh, sort of constellation is, is perhaps what is the most important in, in the formation of, of young people's life. And um, since we do research where we look at how much time kids spend, I mean, the overwhelming majority of time they spend is in presence, firstly, of a parent, and secondly, of, of a teacher or, or a school person. So they have the, these are the two um, key actors that has the real powers in prevention. So, so a question then for, let's say, government to think about, how do we mobilize, how do we use best use parents, how do we best use teachers to, uh, to do this course? And that, I think that is a, is a key strategic at, point. At, at the risk of blowing this conversation up with American politics, <laughs> it is said that many Trump supporters don't like Hillary Clinton because they remind, she reminds them of their fourth grade teacher and that the teacher is in the role of telling you, you can't do this, you can't do that, and restricting the theory. It's this whole theory of reactance uh, uh, in political psychology that is, is about uh, trying to limit uh, uh, what some people call dominion or, or the, the, the freedom to do whatever you, you feel like. And I, I don't know that the teacher, 
role is any less ambiguous here than, than the parenting role, that in, in so far as I can remember bad teachers who really hated me, probably with good reason, uh, that uh, might, might have easily have pushed me the wrong way, or some might say she did. Uh, but there are, are there people in particular that, that stood out in some of the analyses, even in 65, when I think teachers were far more predominantly female, perhaps, than they are today, but uh, Travis, uh, what, what does your research tell us about teachers versus parents? Because we've left th that out of this, this discussion of the P's. Uh, <clears throat> there was a question uh, I thought we were going to be asked later, which I prepared for. Uh, <clears throat> As the you only like. one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do you identify children who are in, at risk for being, uh, having further trouble with the law? And the, the answer, the clear answer is, truancy or what it's now called, uh, unexcused absence or whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, all the schools keep track of it. Uh, the pro and uh, <clears throat> clearly, truancy, as it was called in the old days, is an excellent predictor of delinquency and subsequent difficulty, and it, 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 sh it appears early in, in the school experience, mm -hmm. third or fourth grade, second or third grade, kids stop coming for various reasons or don't or come erratically. And that tells you a great deal about the family situation because where is mama, mama's daddy when the kid is not in school? Mm -hmm. uh, so it leads you to the family as a, as a place where you might make a difference. And I think what you would learn if you looked at families where um, truancy is common, you would find that the parent often doesn't know the child is not going to school. Well, it's, I think it's a little bit more complicated. Well, of than course that. you do, girl. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, yes, I think truancy is a good predictor of delinquency, but it's also a measure of delinquency, right? Oh, absolutely, so, absolutely. So, and in terms of families, for example, who are neglectful, um, what's happening is that they are allowing, it's not that the kids are sort of, um, you know, hiding, hiding. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's uh. too much trouble or that they, the parents haven't, you know, I mean, so yeah. that there's, um, I, I do think that the schools can be a very important player, mm. certainly in the case of, of abused and neglected children in both, in, 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 in fact, in very positive ways, mm. so that when a, a child um, is having problems, schools can bring it to the attention. And, and so what percentage, can you recall, of the abuse cases would have been identified by the teachers and, and triggering the social services to look into the case? Is that fairly common in your data or Sweden? I, I don't have those figures, yeah. but the Child Protection Services I mean, do have those figures. I think both of my uh, co-winners have found that neglect is very important. Yes, yes. it is. Uh, as even opposed to abuse. Actually, <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up because <laughs> that's one of the points that I wanted to make. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, the assumption, uh, the old assumption of the cycle of violence was that it was only physical abuse that led to the perpetration of, of physical violence when a person became an adolescent or an adult. But one of the surprising things that we found was that neglected children are also at risk for violence. And in fact, in our most recent um, analysis, we find that neglected children have now surpassed physically abused kids in terms of being arrested for violence. So it's an extremely important phenomena, problem, and it is 80% of the cases in the United States, and I'm sure that it's the vast majority of the cases here, and it's often just neglected. Um, so I'm glad you brought it up. Minister, does that fit your experience uh, in, in that ministry? Yes, but the point I made before is that because we have child care covering almost every children, uh, that means that we can, we find out these things earlier. Not when they are six or seven or eight, but even though when they are three or four, we can, we can, we can see it all. 
Sometimes we don't act uh, as we should do then on the information, and that's a, a big problem. And, but also there's always this tricky balance of when, when should society step in and what kind of, of, of uh, things should we do. I mean, the, 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 uh, in, 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 the, in the extreme cases, we can take care of the, of the children. Uh, we have to take care of the children just to protect them. But there are a long way on before we are doing that, and we have to do another, a lot of our other strategies before that. And that's, uh, that's easy, uh, even uh, also a, a question, because uh, if I could put it to, to the point, is, is, a, is a bad parent better than, than no parent at all? That's, well, well, I guess, what's the core of your, of your research. I, I, well. And well, Here's the problem. The problem is if you talk sometimes to children, people who have histories of physical abuse, depending on where they are now in their lives, they may say, that was my dad. He did beat me, but he cared about me. Mm -hmm. Whereas with neglect, when you are essentially abandoned or your needs are not provided, there isn't someone. And that, in fact, may be more powerful than, and maybe this is what you were thinking, um, it may be more powerful than neglect, the rejection, the abandonment, than the beating because at least you can, in your mind, say, he, he cared about me. Mm -hmm. So, I complicated. Wondering. That's exactly the uh, mind yeah. you with that. Yeah. What we call abuse uh, is the use of a maybe a disciplinary technique that we don't approve of. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the child may have a very different view of what that abuse, abuse means. It means that I did something wrong and my parent cares enough to protect it, to correct me. And, and we have become so uh, <clears throat> concerned about physical violence that uh, I think we overplay its um, tend to overplay yeah. its potential for damage. And in terms of sexual abuse, the English writer Elizabeth Jane Howard uh, had parents uh, who she had very different relationships with. Uh, uh, she had a very bad relationship with her mother, as she describes it, a good relationship with her father, and she was 14, he sexually abused her, and she was deeply affected by that, but uh, for the rest of her life, she still felt much closer to her father than to her mother. And, uh, um, and as far as I know, it never became violent. Uh, so Probably there, not. yes, uh, there, there is this, this question of, uh, which I don't think we've really adequately addressed in the research, what happens to those relationships after the child is separated from the parent, when we have to make that tough decision? And do we have any uh, any uh, advice from Sweden about how you might be able to maintain the relationship while protecting the child, uh, and sort of having the cake and eating it too, or is that essentially impossible? Uh, you must have dealt with cases like that. Of course, yes. Uh, and, and I think it is, ex it is very important that you can keep that, that connection, even in those cases when you have to step in. Uh, because as you also know, the Swedish position on, on violence against children are quite strong. I mean, there is a non-tolerance right. in the Swedish uh, perspective. We have a law saying you cannot right. use physical violence to, uh, to uh, your children. Right. No that, spanking. No spanking, no. Right. And, and I mean, that's the legislation that we, we've right. had since 1979, yes. And it also tells you something about how the relation should be between a parent and, and a child, because we think that if you are tolerating this, uh, if, if you're not, if you're not reacting to this, then uh, next generation are taught in to use violence to get to, towards right. their, their friends or, or to, to their own children, and that is bad. So we so, can hear Sweden it, to England on and this that's, uh, And that's a different situation in England. I, I mean, you're Swedish, but you're working in England. <laughs> and, and also in the American perspective, totally. where, there, where there is totally. a totally different uh, perspective. And the rates of violence couldn't be more different. Uh, that doesn't mean that we step in and that we take care of every child that is being uh, spanked. We, we don't do that. But it is a criminal offense, since we know of, of doing it. I, I, I think this is really the crucial point, because what you really say is that the 1979 law and the changes, and since I've been part of that, obviously, being here, is that what it really did, it changed 
how acceptable it is for parents to use uh, physical force or, or, or hitting children. And the, if you look at a range of areas, if you think about policy in this, then it's, it's changing things from being uh, acceptable to being unacceptable. That really is the key to major policy changes. We can see that in smoking, drink, driving, everything. So in the family, if we uh, address things, I think, with, with families, so you should really think about things that change key things that makes them unacceptable. That's so, and that, that, that's going, because that's going to affect all um, the parents and have a major effect. The problem with, with I think, with uh, focusing on, on sort of professionals and so on, which is really important, is that perhaps they see the kids, psychologists and so see the kids for one hour, two hours and so on. And there's very little prospect of having a major effect. Because if, if we can mobilize parents and teachers generally by things like that, that is where we can have uh, really major impacts on, on crimes. So I think in terms of policy, that's a key. But what have you found in yes. relation to uh, physical discipline mm. that would be mm. illegal in Sweden, mm -hmm. uh, when it's practiced in England, how mm. does that relate to the development of criminality or its absence uh, in the Peterborough uh, study. Is there any picture that uh, has emerged about that? No, it, it, well, it, 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 I could say we have the data because we actually asked for uh, the, the, uh, it, what I could say, it, it's, it's quite commonly used in, in, in the UK and, and, and it's uh, surprisingly high up in the ages and so on. But we haven't done specific, uh, specific analysis of that and the, not comparing with that. But let me give another example just to the acceptability, which I think is the key. Drugs. You can really see the UK, Sweden, and that involves how the families, parents, um, if a lot of parents, teachers and so on, have reasonably positive views on, on the drug use, which I think is more commonly in the UK than in Sweden. And we can see in our findings that the attitudes uh, are much more... Um, uh, restrictive in Sweden than in the UK, and the drug use uh, is much lower in Sweden. Again, it's a good example of the ex acceptability and so on. So that's, I think that the re although that's important, that's the only point I want to make, is that it's easy to fo focus on details, but it's this kind of general, uh, what, what you could say, ac acceptability things that that really makes big differences in, in policy. Racism, bullying, uh, a lot of other examples you can give. So we've had a fair discussion about mm. child welfare policies. Let, let me move to the second policy area, uh, which I think um, not necessarily all of the prize winners have addressed, but it's, it's this issue of whether the parents are brought in by the police when the kid gets into trouble. And there's lots of historical accounts of police uh, taking kids who were caught stealing or doing other um, things that could be charged fairly seriously by a prosecutor. And in the old days, they would take them home to the parents, hoping that there might have been spanking, uh, for example. So uh, this, uh, uh, this all fell out of favor in the 60s uh, when, I think, uh, the right to uh, defense for children became uh, mandatory in the United States in the Galt decision. Uh, and, and so the police have much more often now played it safe by going right to the prosecutors. And, and a recent review of the effects of prosecution decisions shows that it increases delinquency to prosecute the kids as opposed to diverting them back to their families. Uh, so uh, is, is there a message that we have about the way police might use your research uh, to get better prevention effects? Uh, for delinquency, and in particular in, in ways that uh, they might deal with uh, parents who they, the police will often say the parents don't really care, so I'm not going to work with them. But I, I, I suggest to them, it, that's a testable hypothesis, <laughs> you know, you could at least give it a try. But uh, I don't know, start, start with Kathy, what would, what would you advise the police uh, in relation to this research? Well, I, I think that's a really interesting example because we have, um, I don't, I, I think that the police are still doing, um, in some communities, uh, taking, when a child, a young child is uh, walking around on the streets um, at an inappropriate time by themselves, that in some neighborhoods, when the police know the families, they will take that child home mm. and 
and that's a, a, a positive way, I think, to respond and maybe talk to the parents about this is not appropriate. But in other neighborhoods, particularly in poorer and in, in um, minority neighborhoods, the police are not doing that for whatever reason, but are taking the children to the police station mm -hmm. and are detaining the children. And it seems to us in some of our work that those very two different styles of policing is having a major impact on who gets arrested among this larger group of children. And, and I would suggest that um, I've been trying to figure out a way that we could actually test this hypothesis in the US, uh, short of sort of randomly assigning patrol officers to, you know, to take this kid. I mean, I think it could be done if we could get, but I think it's a very powerful, uh, in fact, in the most recent science article, you will note that there's a, a portion after the title, uh, which is the intergenerational transmission of child abuse and neglect, colon, um, real or surveillance bias. Mm. And I think this question of um, who is who is paying attention to these families, and then how do they respond is a critical factor then in terms of what happens to that child. And you can imagine a young kid who's, you know, walking around the streets being picked up by the police and taking to a detention center could easily then develop a chip on his shoulder, which he didn't or she didn't have before, and then the next time it happens, it's very hard to get out of that pattern. Now, it's great that you brought up what many would call labeling theory because my first <laughs> encounter with Travis Hershey at the American Sociological Association in 1975 was seeing him on a big stage ripping apart Edwin Lamert, uh, one of the authors of labeling theory, uh, because it just didn't jibe with the way Travis was seeing the world. Do you, do you recall it differently from what I'm saying? And, I and remember you wanna... every word. <laughs> <laughs> but what is your view about uh, the, these well, reactions? Let me, let me cite some statistics I think that are highly reliable. If you look at the difference between, let's say, single parent, two parent families, you get a 10% difference, let's say, in the percentage of kids who report delinquent acts. If you go to arrest statistics, it gets larger. By the time you get to the uh, institutions, the prisons, it's immense. I mean, some people come back and says, no one there has a father, kind of. Mm -hmm. It's crazy, because it's only 90%. Uh, <laughs> but it's very rare. So the, one way you can look at the relation between the family and the public and the government is that the family stands between the, the child and the police or whatever. And if they don't do the job, the police are not out to, the public, the state is not out to grab children. It, mm -hmm. It's kind of forced to take them because of the behavior of the parents and the child. So uh, I personally would, uh, I, I like your kind of suggestion that we're too quick to grab the kids or to interfere. If you look at longitudinal research over a long period, I mean, we have in our country, in the United States, uh, surveys that started in the 30s that have followed people until they're, they're gone, right? All their lives. And when they find them at very old age, they think back of their families and what it was like when they were kids. I mean, if people don't have that experience, they, their lives are impoverished. Mm -hmm. and, and the state is not, the state is not in the business of raising kids, but and know, shouldn't be. I know in Cambridgeshire, uh, the police can get into a lot of trouble <laughs> if they uh, were to take the kids home rather than to the police station, where the custody sergeant makes the decision as to whether to let the kid go uh, with or without some sort of stigma, uh, as in two 15-year-old uh, kids, a boy and a girl, touching each other inappropriately, which in Cambridgeshire routinely gets young men put on the sex offender register for the rest of their lives. Uh, so here we have, you know, official criminalization for 
what in, uh, I, I don't think this is illegal in Sweden, but maybe, maybe I don't know anything about it. Uh, too many Swedish movies. Touching each I've, other in irregular ways. Yes, well, two, two 15 year olds is, 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 well, is all I uh, want to say about my own memories. Uh, yep. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the issue for uh, Peterborough, I, I think, is being explored by, by P.O. Wikström uh, in, in terms of these official versus self reported. Do you, do you have any, any insights from that research uh, on the role of the police and maybe doing things better or differently uh, to try to prevent crime? Uh, the, well, the, to be to frank, not really, but the, the, w w what is important if you, if you talk about the police role, and uh, I, I think what the finding shows, and that again brings it back to the importance of the uh, sort of the family, parents, and the teachers as the baseline. We really do remember, I think, when we talk about it, that most, the overwhelming majority of young people uh, rarely do crime or do no crime. I mean, it's about 80, uh, around 80% 80 of our, who are really no crime. So, so um, it's not a general phenomenon. So the police, the criminal justice systems and so on kicks in uh, where, where sort of the, the basis uh, fail. So, so in terms of thinking about po policy, the police role is, is really where the basic system fails. And but what can the police do then? Well, if you look, well, you, as you know, you're very interested in hotspots and so on. So it, it, really, we, we have the concentrations of, of um, uh, places where crime-prone people get together with uh, criminogenic settings. And here, I think the police can play, play a role, and you can discuss a lot what, what kind of things they can do. So that would be uh, one major area to manage this, as, as I think you call, risky moral context in a, in a sense and prevent them and so on. Um, and um, we, we, in terms of that, but that, that's really, is, I think, the, the, the major role the police uh, could do. And, uh, but we haven't done any specific on, on, on the issue uh, you mentioned earlier. Well, one of the big things Travis's uh, research is cited for is this idea of involvement in conventional activities, uh, which the police take up in many countries with police athletic leagues, other ways of uh, having positive interaction between police and, and young people. And uh, these things have never really been rigorously uh, evaluated, um, but it, it's not clear to me that the police need to be doing it as, as much as perhaps to be aware of the role that uh, sports or other regular activities uh, after school hours uh, can, um, can make a difference in, in just sort of uh, as, as the midnight basketball debate 20 years ago in the United States put it, uh, keep the kids out of trouble. Then famously we had some shooting incidents at midnight in a basketball court and a lot of people said, see, right. we told you so. Right. Uh, but that, that may be for different reasons besides <laughs> whether basketball is a good thing. You found lots of different kinds of in involvement uh, in these things, Travis. It, is that still, you think, as powerful? I had four bonds to society, one of which was involvement, eating up the time so that they couldn't commit delinquent acts. And then I learned by looking more closely at the phenomenon that most crimes take about a split second. Yep. <laughs> And uh, as I used to tell my class, we can stay here all day and we still have time when we get out of class <laughs> <laughs> to do all the crime that, that we can imagine. And then I committed six crimes on the way to my lecture, that kind of thing. And, mm -hmm. and so taking time is not the issue, I think, using up the kids' time. Uh, uh, P.O. has a lot of data showing how little, how immense amounts of time and there are only a few crimes committed in them. So there's a lot of time that's not criminal and very little time it is. So it's very hard to shrink that, that little time into nothing. And right. So you can tie them to the future or tie them to an interest or something, but you don't really achieve much by keeping them busy if they're not interested in, in being non-criminal. Yeah, yeah you just say that, uh, just add to that, that even the most active uh, criminals we have in our, our sample offend less than three hours a week, mm -hmm. awake in time, and so on. So that's one point. Thank goodness. Yeah, yeah. So in, in, in the sense. The second point, I, I think, we, we, my reading of the literature on leisure activities, when we asked the parents in Peterborough, what do you think would be the most effective prevention, they all say more leisure activities for kids. 
my reading of, of the research on Lesher and so on is actually that it has no effect or the reverse effect that actually a lot of leisure activities fuse crimes and so on by bringing together people and so on. Um, and I, th I think that that's one of the, um, it's, it's a major mistake to think that people actually commit crime because the boards have nothing to do and so on, uh, which, which is a very common uh, policy. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 so in, in, in the sense that when, when something happens like riots in neighborhoods and so on, often the, the idea is that it's because the kids are bored, they have nothing to do and so on. And I, I think that's the role, totally wrong part to take on that one. Minister, <laughs> what do you well, think? Maybe, maybe not because they're bored, but yeah. when, when you're using uh, civil society, athletes, uh, organizations, for instance, and other things, well, uh, apart from for them having children or, or kids to do something, what, what we also is creating is role, good role models. And, they, and also the kids are learning to, to uh, be a part of a structure. And I don't know if, you, if you've done any research about that, but, but in, in, in my mind, it should be a positive thing. Uh, both the, and, and I've seen a lot of examples on that. I mean, people who are uh, kids who are, who are um, what else, who should probably end up elsewhere, they are, they are directing their activities on, th on something good, and they find if they don't have a father figure or someone else who look up to them, all, all of a sudden they find someone there in this, in this organization. That they're, if, it, if it's basketball or if it's football or whatever it is. So, uh, well, on a, on a, uh, on a general level, I, that should be a good thing. Not because they are doing something, because they, they, they are not bored, but because they find role models, some, someone to look up to and another direction of their lives. Minister, <clears throat> just on this point, and I want to ask all three prize winners to comment on Joan McCord's uh, uh, Cambridge Somerville study. This is uh, somebody who would have won the Stockholm Prize if she'd lived long enough, but she did follow up uh, for 30 years after a very well-controlled experiment that uh, just dealt with boys whose fathers were pretty much missing. So fatherless boys, half of them got to have, uh, a, 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 shall we say, a, a positive role model uh, who was a professional social worker who would spend uh, Saturdays with them, maybe not every Saturday, but they would go to lots of sports activities. They would also involve themselves with other kids whose fathers were also missing, so that they, these were all at-risk kids who got brought together by the program, and in the control group where they didn't get the program, they didn't get brought together. It, it went on in the summer where the kids who were getting the program all went to summer camp together, and the kids who didn't get the program stayed home. And a lot of people said, how can you have an experiment like that? It's, it's unethical because uh, you're depriving these kids of the program. But it turned out 30 years later that the kids who didn't get the program were better off, uh, less criminal, less uh, mentally ill, less alcoholic, uh, didn't die as soon. Um, and Joan McCord's theory about that was this, this concept of deviant peer contagion, which is uh, this notion that if you, if you put kids who have problems with kids who don't have problems, maybe they'll get to be more like the kids who don't have problems. But if you put kids who have problems with other kids who have problems, it's like throwing oil in the fire and making it all much worse. And that's an insight that I found working with uh, government practitioners, whether police or social workers or others, that very hard for them to accept that because it's efficient to put the, ch the troubled kids together. And it, it seems fairer that you give a program to kids who need it as opposed to kids who don't. And, and yet, from that study and some other evidence, Ken Dodge and others at Duke, would suggest that we have to be worried about these, these programs because they, they throw people together with more deviant peers than they would otherwise be associated with. So uh, maybe, Kathy, you could comment on that uh, well, in relation to your, your findings. Just, um, this has also been called the iatrogenic effect right. of um, putting uh, kids together who, who have problems in supposedly some sort of a, even a therapeutic context. But the, the uh, interesting thing is that it's not, uh, it doesn't, have this negative impact for all kids, right. that it appears to be very specific um, to children who are ages 12 to 14. So, but it, it, um, it was a very important and very sad lesson to learn from McCord's work. 
um, and then carried forth with other researchers as you... Um, we don't um, have information, unfortunately, about peers in, in our study, but one of the things that we have found, which I think is very important, is that graduating from high school is a protective factor against being arrested um, for crime as an adult. Mm -hmm. And it is not the same as getting um, a, a GED, which is where if, if you drop out of school in the United States, you can then go back and you can get a high school diploma, but you haven't gone through the socialization process of graduating. And it is that experience that seems to be protective. And so one of the things that we are thinking about is how, if we can really zero in on exactly what is it about that process because if we could keep maltreated children in school longer to be able to stay mm. with their peers who are not getting into, you know, the whole, and have that experience, then they would, um, in fact, be maybe able to go to college, but, but probably have more economically productive lives later on, and then have just sort of better lives. So. I think that this uh, it gets back to the issue of social support, but it also gets back to the, to the uh, role of teachers, and I don't think we know enough about it, but it, in several of our uh, papers now, we're finding this very powerful effect, um, and, and I think it's something we need to pay attention to. P.L., in your research? Yeah. Yes, I will, I, will, I will say two things. The uh, first thing is that if you look at the, the bottom line, why people do crime, come back to that, we find it's basically two reasons. And it's, you could call it personal morality, and now if you find X acceptable. The other is what you can refer to as lack of self control or that, that you uh, fail for peer pressure. So, the, so, if we talk about leisure activities, it's leisure activities that help people in terms of the personal morality and the self-control that might be useful. However, the problem is I think a lot of um, uh, activities in the leisure, particularly the activities targeting young people who have problems or are involved in criminology, try to be exciting and bring them in and so on and uh, do various things. So, so it's probably a bit of a silly example, but rather than doing car racing, uh, cage fighting and so on, they should, they should play chess. I mean, that's an extreme example. But it's the content of the, of the activities and so on. So I don't, don't think you can say that. And I'll give you, give you one good example from when I had a talk with this and, and somewhere in Sweden, and I presented findings about this. And there was um, actually a police officer who were very angry with me in the break. And they came up and, and, and said to me that he, he was running a, a youth club in his spare time. Mm. And he came up to me in the break and said, how oh, can you say this? And so and then we start talking for a while. And after a while, he said, uh, said well, come to think that we, we have to shut the cl club down for three months for renovation. It has never been so calm and so on. So it, it, it really is uh, important. I, th I think leisure activities, uh, th that's one area. There's uh, probably one other area that... I think it's important to discuss, but we, I'll leave that for later. But it, it's more, the, if I think about what, what, what makes people, young people engage in crime, does these particular activities and leisure helps them in terms of uh, having, uh, seeing certain types of crimes and non-acceptable and so on, or increasing their self-control, then it might be helpful, else, else it might not. And actually, some might actually fuel it by, uh, by weakening self-control and, 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 and giving them so, sort of, yeah, mm. I'll leave now, that. Now, Minister, we have about 10 minutes, and I don't think I've given you enough chance to ask questions of the, the winners on any of these topics we brought up so far. You may have some other things you'd like to raise, so please uh, take, uh, take the helm here. Well, uh, one of the main issues here is how do you, uh, as we've been in the, before, is how do we that we do we spot these children in time and how do we what kind of activities do we do we, do we strategies do we have to to uh, improve their, their situation so they don't end up in crime um, we have figures in sweden i think there was research saying that half of, of all the crimes being committed 
is being committed by, by less than 2% of the, of the population, mm. which tells us that if we, if we could spot the, these children in time and do the right thing, that would be very good. Um, uh, how do you balance the, 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 the issue of, of general policies? And I t then I'm talking about the big picture here, the general welfare state uh, providing uh, good possibilities for, the, for, 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 uh, for all people. To get along with the, the directed um, uh, strategies directed to individuals or individual groups, the Swedish position has always been that well, we need a, a strong general welfare state as a as a platform, and then upon that we need to, to do things directed. But we we do but we always said that if we don't if we will remove that general platform then and just working with directed activities, then we would stigmatize people in a way that wouldn't be good. I would be very interested, because this is a huge, of course, ideological issue in the brain. I would like to, to hear from you, how do you see and uh, look upon that, the, that issue? Um, the balance between general active strategies and, and, and directed. And, and maybe in terms of parenting, you know, there are these programs that try to teach parenting, and one of the issues is, do you just teach parents who are not doing so well, or do you try to teach everybody so it becomes less stigmatized? Yes. And I, I don't know if your research directly relates to that, but I'm sure you all have, have, have views. Uh, Travis, you want to kick off? <clears throat> I think the, um, <clears throat> the best predictor of criminal behavior, by far, is prior criminal behavior. Mm. And that is the, the state criminal justice system has always used that criterion mm. for the reason that predicting crime from non-crime is a very risky kind of operation mm. and it's kind of contrary to our values. So the criminal justice system, insofar as it predicts crime properly at all, is it, when it's doing it right. And it's very risky, therefore, to try to assume criminality. Mm for purposes of punishment or whatever, uh, on, on the basis of limited not information. But, but what about prevention? And, and let, me push you, let me push you on the idea of your self-reported crime uh, showing a lot more crime than the officially detected. So we've got undetected kids, we've got kids who might be predictable for other factors who we could try to prevent, not punish, but prevent. Yeah. Would, you, would you still The real that problem deal? with self-reported crime is that too many people report it. Yeah, they yes. over, they're, they're bragging, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, they're, they're, they actually do it, but it's trivial. The criminal justice system very often would not pay attention to it the way we, we pay attention to as, it. As so criminal, it's, it's, yeah. not a, it's not an all-purpose solution to yeah. the problem. Uh, it's a, a dangerous solution. Uh, yeah. it, it's like survey research is highly dangerous in this respect. I mean, we hear that 20% of college females in the United States are sexually assaulted during their, everyone reports that now. Every state, every university says, we're right up there with them. We got 20% sexually assaulted. If you look at the number of people who actually report sexual assaults during their college years, it's something like one in 52, mm. uh, rather than one in five. So frequency rather than prevalence. Uh, no, it, or, or survey versus it's, it's, the officials. It's, it's people saying that they've done something that was trivial in their own mind. Right. Right. Uh, I Kathy. personally think that uh, these methodological issues um, that we're sort of skirting around are extremely important. Mm. Um, but I don't think that we're going to sort of solve them here. Um, and I, I would love to get into um, a one of uh, my doctoral students, for example, is doing an analysis of uh, retrospective reports um, in comparison to documented information and the discrepancies. And, and we have in the past done comparisons of official reports and self-reports. So I think these are huge questions. But the issue that you raised about really, which is the sort of public health you know, the issues of universal or secondary or, you know, primary uh, prevention. I, I think these are all the struggles, and I, I applaud the fact that you are dealing at, at these uh, three levels. There, in fact, was an interesting um, randomized uh, 
a trial in the United States where they, um, in addition to uh, individualized and family-focused uh, prevention efforts using a, a, a program called Triple P, which is a very sort of, you probably know about it, it's a very, um, has a man, it's manualized. But what they did was something unusual. They wanted to see if they could take the principles of this in a, in a uh, primary prevention, universal prevention model. So they took um, 18 counties in uh, South Carolina mm -hmm. and they matched them and they, uh, in half of the counties, they did a, a public service announcements and um, videos and, and a whole major campaign to see if they could have an impact on child maltreatment rates. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it was uh, successful and it was, it was the first. So, so they moved from more individualized efforts to this county-wide level, which I think we need to do more of. Um, so I think that it would be, um, uh, clearly we have to pay attention to the children and the families that are being identified and suspected, and we need to find out what the issues are and what, you know, what you're doing, and then provide them with the services. We can't just identify them and do nothing. We have to have the services to be able to follow through. Um, but I also think that the much bigger picture in terms of society can have an impact. Yeah. P.O.? Well, I did, uh, I'm not, not going to repeat that, but I'll uh, say something on the point on general welfare. I, I think uh, I agree, and that's important that families and schools have resources and so on. But I think what, what one often forget is the content. It's not just having resources and so on, it's, it's, it's the content. And, the, and that, that's probably particularly in the schools, in, in the sense that, yes, the, the, there's a lot of problems in more problematic areas with schools lacking resources and so on. But just putting in resources in terms of money and so on is not enough. It, it's also the, considering what content and, again, what we like to achieve. So um, um, we, we have a kind of a, a problem there. Um, one issue we could have talked about is, is the link between disadvantage and crime, but I, I think we leave that for tomorrow. Disadvantage and crime will no doubt feature in your yeah. prize-winning uh, addresses. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for our remaining minutes, I want to uh, uh, return the floor to the minister. You, you have the last word, the last question, or <laughs> however you choose uh, well, to proceed. Well, no, I think this has been a very, very important uh, uh, discussion, a very interesting dis discussion. And uh, I'll try to, to, to summarize it by, by myself later on when I have to, to melt it. But uh, for instance, um, we talked about uh, not just a strategy, but also how the, the discussion around the society and how do you look upon certain things. Like, for instance, now when you just mentioned sexual, sexual assault among young women, well, maybe now there is a, a, a framework an environment where you can talk about this. Well, you couldn't do that a, a couple of decades ago. Mm -hmm. You mentioned divorce uh, later, uh, earlier in the discussion. Well, when I, when I grew up 35 years ago, 40 years ago, just a couple of, of my friends were in my class. They had parents that, was divor that were divorced, and that was looked upon as something very strange. Nowadays, in Sweden, every other couple is, is divorced, and that is now something natural. And you mentioned that, well, that could be a, a, a negative thing for children. Well, that also depends on how the rest of the society exactly. looks upon exactly. uh, such a situation and how you deal with a, with a situation with, with a divorce, for instance. And that also connects it to, to the discussion we had, a brief discussion we had about, about how you look upon violence uh, against children and spanking and so on, how we change, actually, with policies, change the mindset of, of people. I'm not sure that, the, well, this, this is some of the, the aspects that I take from, from this discussion. Also, of course, the whole discussion about general welfare contra, contra the, the direct uh, uh, strategies that, that, that we use. And um, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, discussion. And, We'll see each other again tomorrow <laughs> night at, uh, the, when we're going to when you when will you will you will have your prizes and we'll look forward to that. Thank you very yeah, much, thank Minister. You. Thank you all uh, for joining us today.
Thank you. Thank you very much.